it was kind of an ideal, it was kind of an ideal society. Everything ran well. There was no authority in government, but there were positions, but the positions weren't uh, horribly time consuming and they could, they could kind of be done. So seeing the power, the awesome power of the Vril and uh, the peace that it could bring to society, you can understand why uh, different secret societies, specifically in Germany at the time, were really interested in searching for this type of power. You may remember from the last episode when we talked about the Vril Society and the beautiful women with the long hair who were the, some of the founding members of the Vril Society. And who, well, who eventually made contact with Aldebaran and actually got some type of energy that powered the flying saucers the that Hitler flying used saucers that during Hitler World War used. II. And maybe a honeyboot dreadnought that they supposedly had. And could it be that the dreadnought and its awesome killing power, I mean, who could oppose that? was the packaging of this thing for governments to, to rule. Maybe, because, you know, I couldn't help thinking about that sky dreadnought when uh, I was reading about the use of Vril by the children who and, and the end of all war, because suddenly now anyone has at their fingertips this power to just destroy anything, just like the sky dreadnought. Right. No one's going to want to confront or oppose that power. But the, but the Vril Society, supposedly, through their long hair and their psychic abilities, contacted Aldebaran and That's got some right. information. And that, you know, that long hair, some people say, it. actually there are many groups who really believe that there's a power in the hair. They're like millions of antennae, and that helps them to have their psychic abilities. In fact, I just saw a story about a group of uh, Native American Indians who were hired by the, the U.S. government to do some tracking. And when they were constrict, conscripted into the army, they, they got the traditional army haircut. All their hair was cut off, and they lost all their abilities for all of their psychic powers, their abilities to do any kind of tracking. And uh, when that was discovered, they, they allowed them to regrow their hair and did a, did a test. And right. their power came back. Right. So I really do think there is something to the power right. in that. And most South American tribes, probably North American tribes too, before they were wiped out, wore their hair very long because they're very spiritually oriented uh, yeah. folk. Now our first, ground, first personal contact with people who deal with underground civilizations wasn't through this book or learning about the Brill Society. It was in traveling in Brazil because we came upon the, the writings and teachings and actually settlement communities started by a, a very famous Brazilian philosopher named Jose Trigorino. Now Trigorino had been contacted one day while on hiking around the town of Capricha de Monte. Which is in the Cordoba province. Is that right? Cordoba? Cordoba province. In Argentina. So Capricha de Monte is a really interesting town. The whole town <clears throat> seems to be aware that there is an underground civilization just on the other side of their mountain range called Oroturco, which connects to a small village called Angamira. And craft are seen coming and going all the time. Over the mountains and the people that live there, you know, they just watch it. I mean, they watch it happening. And there's other phenomena that happens here too. Uh, Angamira is a, is a Trigorino settlement that's on top of Erx, which is the underground settlement that contacted Jose Trigorino. Right. Now, the people that live in uh, Caprice de Monte are very used to orbs coming in and out of the top of the mountain. They also have this strange phenomenon of women laughing. You tell them about it. 
Oh, yes, a friend that we met told us a story on the dark of the moon. Many times they have seen and heard a group of about five or six very tall black women giggling as they walk through the mountains. Right. Yeah. I, don't know what, I don't know what they're seeing, but they certainly hear them. Right. Well, I think because they've been described, they have been seen. Yeah, it's a very spiritual the place. There's a real cool feel about it. But, so we were more interested in finding out uh, about more of uh, the locations that Trigorino had marked out in Brazil, and one of them was called the Honkador. So we went to the Mount Honkador. Now, Honkador supposedly is a little, well, I didn't even see a settlement when we were there. The it's Honkador just, is the name mountain. of the mountain. Right, it's the mountain. Right. So we, we got in as far as the mountain. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh yeah, we, we stayed in a place and hiked up the mountain. We actually were really interested in exploring the underground civilization and one of the entrances supposedly is through the a lake that's that's located right in the middle of an indigenous area. We didn't we didn't go into that Indian reservation, and I'll tell you why. It was because um, the Indians were just so terrifying there. They were large, very solemn faced, and imposing, and supposedly. Uh, there had been somebody, Admiral Fawcett? Yes, I think his first name might have been Percy Fawcett. He and his son went to explore this underground civilization and disappeared never to be seen again. But the host of the place where we stayed warned us specifically not to go to find the lake because many people who had gone had left their cars and uh, were stopped along the way by not one but several chiefs of the Indian community who wanted a bribe of like a hundred dollars or even more and uh, each you know every every so many miles another one would show up asking for, for more money and then when you get back to your car everything's stolen yes yeah, so devastated. we decided not to take that chance but we did climb Mount Ankador yes and that had some strange stories of this weird sound that you could hear, which we did in fact hear. It was eerie. Yeah, let me so, tell them about the, the sight from the top. Okay. The sight from the top of Honkador, you could look out over this landscape, and it was all, all woods and forest. Jungle, maybe you could call it. And uh, there were dark places in the landscape. And as the clouds would roll by, certain dark places would move, you know, like under the clouds, there would be dark under the clouds where the light was shining through. Well, there were certain places out there that wouldn't change. They were dark whether they were under the clouds or not. So that was a little, little strange. We couldn't go back into there. But we started climbing down the mountain, and uh, we were with a bunch of dogs who were with the uh, guide. And then my little dog, uh, and as we climbed down, my little dog started barking. The other dogs just ignored the sound, so I stopped and listened because my dog really is, is tuned in this thing. And sure enough, we heard the sound that's characteristic of this mountain. And supposedly, it's, what are it? It's supposed to be the sound of people guarding the entrance to this I don't remember the remember? exact story, but it is creepy. It was an amazing sound. It's, it's, they say it's wind, but I, I've listened to wind for a long time. This wasn't wind. It sounded like if you're standing next to a giant hill and there's 60 jaguars on that hill and they all decide to scream at once and growl. Yes. That's what it sounded like. That is what it sounded like. It was, it was the most supernatural thing. Yeah. And we, we encountered it at the, at the Honkador in the middle of Brazil. So we cut our trip short there and ventured over to the next Chapada, which are um, designated national parks where a community of Trigorino's followers, which they call Figuera, 
for some reason, lived. And we met with a group of these people who showed us a whole photo album uh, of the building of, of the house over which perched during every picture over a series of weeks or months even, this spaceship stayed. It looked pretty much like a cloud, but it never moved. No, it didn't. In every picture. It was, it was a, a non-moving, just really strange object up there. I wouldn't call it a cloud. No, maybe not, but it, it was definitely hovering. It was definitely hovering. Well, anyway, the Triggerino and his, uh, his followers that live in these different communities um, are in touch with the underground civilization and they talk to and chant to the underground civilization in the underground civilization's language, which is Eerdan. Right. And I thought you might like to hear a, a sample of Eerdan chanting. <laughs> So this connection with Triggerino and his teachings and his followers is very mysterious and quite fascinating. And it's throughout the world. It's all over. It's all over the place. Yeah. So we'll leave a, a link to Triggerino's website if you want to explore a little bit more. Right. It, it's a serious thing, and it's not. Uh, that's something to be taken lightly, but if you're interested in uh, learning more about them, reading some of the things that have been translated in English, we'll leave it on the show notes for you. Sounds good. Okay. So, anyway, we found it uh, in several sources on pretty good authority that supposedly the Brazilian under underground community and all that catacombs under under Brazil is connected under the ocean and up into the into the mountains of the Himalayas uh, under the mountains of the Himalayas in Tibet yeah in Tibet yeah I saw one or two references to Mato Grosso Brazil Mato Grosso Brazil mm -hmm. to uh, Tibet to the Shang, what is it? Shangri-La? No, not Shangri-La. Oh, it's, it's Shambhala, Shambhala, but it was portrayed as Shangri-La. Mm -hmm. And, uh... Yeah, it was portrayed as Shangri-La, if you can remember that movie. It was an old movie. That was fashioned after Shambhala, which is the underground... Yeah, the city, the capital the city. of Agartha. Agartha, right. That's right. Well, there were two different communities, depending on who you read. Uh, and so that's our connection back to our Tibetans found in Berlin by the Russian puzzle that we opened up with. And we'll get more into that. But here, here's an aside. While we were looking into underground communities and underground civilizations, the Hindus believe that also under, the, uh, under certain mountains, are a civilization called the Nagas. And the Nagas are reptilians, very beautiful reptilians that can fly. Ooh. Now, flying reptilians to me means Draco, but, oh, but, it but also maybe sounds this, like the Vrilia. Right, the Vrilia. But also, uh, these reptilians, which are very beautiful, frequently intermarry with kings and queens on the surface world. So that's just a shout out to David Icke. And what he does and what he says, it might be a little, little backing for that. Oh, there's so many connections and so many different sources. It's just totally yeah, amazing it's to me. It's just wild. So anyway, back to uh, the Nazis and mysticism in Tibet. Let me, let me read a little bit into the legend here. The legends surrounding the realms of Agartha and Shambhala are confusing to say the least. 